it's my great pleasure to introduce a, a very good longtime friend of mine, Patrick Heller, who is not an associate professor, but has recently been promoted to full professor at Brown University in the sociology department and also a joint appointment at the Watson Institute. Um, I first met Patrick in 1999 or 2000 in um, Kerala, India, of all places. I don't even remember exactly why I was there, but I do remember that I met Patrick there, and it was a, a transformative experience uh, for me, not for him, because he'd been working there for a long time. But it really, you know, before I'd been looking at little instances of participatory democracy, you know, thousand people in Chicago or ten thousand across the city, but you go to Kerala, and it's uh, at a much, much larger scale. Um, Patrick uh, has worked on participation and democracy and de development in many different contexts. His first book is called The Labor of Development, and it's about Kerala. And it, you know, kind of everybody knows that uh, from reading Amartya Sen that the the remarkable thing about Kerala is a set of social policies that really improves human development um, quite a bit, especially on gender equity terms. But that kind of begs the question: is why do you get those social policies rather than others? And Patrick's book explains that by looking carefully at social movements and class politics in Kerala uh, over a, a long, long span. Uh, another book project uh, that's more recent that is motivated by some of the same impulses is trying to explain some cases of when development actually works, and rather than uh, much of the work which is looking at why uh, places don't develop. And that, the, that resulted in a book project called Social Democracy in the Periphery. And in that book, he, uh, he and some colleagues look at uh, four or five different countries where the social policies, despite the fact that uh, the level of economic development is middle or low, do have an inclusive social democratic character, um, which is extremely interesting. And today, I think he's going to talk about uh, his current book project, which is looking at uh, dem democratic deepening in three different countries in South Africa, in Brazil, and in India. So it's my pleasure to welcome Patrick. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's it's, uh, it's very exciting to be here. I know the, the last speaker was Klaus Hoffa, someone I've admired for years, and the next speaker is Rina Agarwal, someone who I think is doing some of the most interesting work on India. So it's it's it's, uh, it's very exciting. Uh, to be part of this and have this opportunity to talk a bit about this paper, um, which is really my attempt to find a frame that works for comparing across three really big heterogeneous complex democracies, and specifically to find a comparative framework for thinking about democratic deepening. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll be saying something about case selection, but you know, there's you know, there, there are methodological reasons why we choose cases, and then there's a purely life circumstance driven reasons why we pick cases. And, and Archon's just given me a third reason for why I may have picked these three cases. Namely, the first three times I met him were in India, <laughs> Kerala. The second time was in Brazil, and the third time was in South Africa. And every time it was a conference that had something to do with participation. So who knows? Among other things, I'm borrowing the title of his book with, with Eric Wright. So there are, there are many affinities here. Um, but I, 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 I do want to spend some time talking about the cases. <coughs> one, one of the problems with doing comparative work is that you're always bound to say something that is offensive to area specialists. So let me, let me say immediately that uh, given the time limitations, I can only spend about 10 minutes on each case and so I'm bound to say something <laughs> that will be offensive to the area specialists in the room. But, uh, as but you're being going to try to say something offensive in each case. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> equal opportunity <laughs> offense. Um, but as as you're being offended, think to yourself that this is this is a, a generalization made through comparative lenses. So, and then hopefully in the Q and A, I'll have a, a, a chance to provide a, a little more richness to some of the cases. But I want to begin by just saying a few words uh, about why, for me, this is such an important topic, namely the topic of democracy in the periphery or democracy in the global south or whatever the appropriate terminology might be these days. And uh, you know, I, I essentially want to make the argument that if we're, uh, my, my interest in the global south really started with uh, political economy questions, and in particular questions having to do with whether or not it's possible to pursue uh, developmental trajectories that are actually inclusive, and this is a question that's become more and more uh, complex in an increasingly globalized world economy. 
And I think it is possible, but that the key variable really is the, the quality, the nature, the particular type of uh, democracy that uh, emerges in any particular context. And I, I want to take us back to you know, the very sort of classical conceptions of democracy for a minute and simply pose the question, why is it that democracy is so potentially transformative and indeed why it's so potentially radical? And I think the argument's relatively straightforward, namely that this idea of popular sovereignty is really the only way in which it becomes possible to break the, the, the traditional chain between social and political power. Right? I mean, historically, traditionally, political power is largely an outgrowth of social power, whichever dominant class or dominant ethnic group or dominant caste dominates society, uh, they're invariably uh, in a position to capture political power, and then you get this sort of vicious cycle of reinforcement of durable inequality. And democracy is a radical proposition because as a set of both normative and institutional prescriptions, it's, it's essentially about trying to break that chain, right? That, that direct relationship between social and political power. Um, and it turns out, of course, that this is much more difficult a proposition than just having a, a democracy in place. That by and large, the track record of democracy in, in post-colonial societies has been, on the one hand, uh, inspiring uh, in terms of the number of societies that actually have made the transition to formal democracy, yet on another register, somewhat disappointing in terms of conventional expectations of what might be delivered uh, in, 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 a, in a democratic context. I'm, I'm reminded, on the day Nelson Mandela was released from prison, they interviewed this woman in Soweto, and she said, Nelson Mandela is free, that's wonderful, now where's my house? Um, and you know, 20 years later, chances are she's still waiting for her house. Um, and so, uh, translating formal democracy, of course, into sustaining outcomes has always been complex. And I, I just want to quickly identify three reasons why the challenge is especially pronounced in post-colonial societies. First is the, the simple dead weight of colonial legacies themselves. Unlike the traditional or the first generation pattern of democratization, where uh, uh, democratization itself was part of the process of state formation, in post-colonial societies, states were formed before they were made democratic. And they're much more, oh, they were overdeveloped, this is Hamza Alabi's famous term. And these states, these colonial states, were created largely as extractive institutions, right? Their business was the business of being predatory, of extracting labor and surplus from societies. And the, the apartheid state, of course, is sort of the classic, the braille version of a predatory surplus extracting state. Um, and this is, these are the institutional legacies, and I think this is quite important and in the end um, quite problematic because the balance, and I'll talk about this more later, it makes for a balance between state and civil society that is highly skewed in favor of state apparatuses, state elites, etc. Um, a second problematic is that democratization comes before economic development. Right? So the sequence in Europe is exactly the opposite. First you get the transition out of feudalism, you get capitalism, you have self-sustaining growth, and then, of course, the universal suffrage is extended to the working class. Uh, whereas in much of the post-colonial world, the sequence is, is reversed. Right? I mean, when, when India becomes democratic, it's still 90% peasants. Uh, so peasants have the vote. It's not the working class, it's not the it's the peasantry. Um, and this is problematic because one of the things that democracies are fairly good at doing is managing distributional conflicts. Um, but if there's not much surplus to go around, then there's not much, not many resources for distributing, uh, for, for addressing distributional conflicts, and that inevitably uh, increases the, the kind of conflicts and tensions associated with democratic management. So the economist Pranav Bardhan, who's written in my mind what is still the best book on Indian democracy, called The Political Economy of the State in India. His argument is that the Indian state is really just a coalition of three proprietary classes that manage their distributional conflicts amongst themselves, but that have never really been interested in managing uh, distributional conflicts more broadly. A third set of, of problems that uh, democracies in the global south face now is globalization. And this is a bit of a controversial topic. I don't want to say too much about it, but 
I think Adam Shavorsky has, if you want the bumper sticker version of the argument, he says that under the conditions of globalization with um, key, key forms of, of power and decision making about economic affairs now uh, being taken outside of national sovereign contexts, capital markets, financial markets, etc., it's increasingly more difficult for nominally sovereign democratic governments to pursue the types of social policies demanded by their constituencies. And so some have called this the hollowing out of democracy. Shavorsky argues that it produces a legitimation crisis because increasingly voters realize that they can vote, but they can't choose. Right? So the, the famous story of this is you know, in the run-up to the last presidential election in Brazil, uh, Bid, the Bid de and Lula were running ahead. Uh, I think they were ahead 15, 16 percent in the polls. And all of a sudden, there was massive capital flight. Um, and you know, the threat, of course, was that a return of a bid to government that was beginning to talk about um, um, capital controls and, and, and increasing taxes, et cetera, uh, threatened a capital strike, a very serious capital strike. And Lula immediately said that he would guarantee all loans. He went to the IMF. He made all these public statements to reassure markets. Uh, in the process, of course, alienating a lot of his own base. But in the end, he won the election. Um, so there, there's a tension there, clearly. And some, some believe that these, these structural constraints are um, so severe that there's very few degrees of freedom left for uh, most uh, democracies in the global south. And so people use phrases like the hollowing out of democracy. I'm, I'm actually a bit more uh, optimistic about um, this particular set of conditions than most. And basically, I did this slide here as, as a way, shamelessly, as a way of plugging the book. But Archon kindly already did that. Um, but in this book, uh, which is co-authored co with Mark Edelman and Richard Sandbrook and Judith Teachman, we have four case studies, Chile, Costa Rica, the state of Kerala in India, and uh, the island state of Mauritius in Africa. And you know what we show is that basically for the past, for quite some time now, these have been uh, stable, consolidated democracies, with, of course, the exception of the authoritarian interlude in Chile. But they've been able to manage both equity and growth. So they've, 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 they've promoted uh, a relatively encompassing uh, set of social policies, building welfare uh, states, universalizing access to certain basic public goods. And they've done so while remaining actually quite competitive in the global economy. So Costa Rica and Chile are actually the two best performers in Latin decades. Uh, Kerala, contrary to what Marchesen and others have said, has actually been doing very well economically for the past two decades. Uh, and Mauritius is the, the sort of star exporter of all of Africa. Uh, so it's, it's kind of interesting that the most globally competitive and integrated states within these regions also happen to be the most inclusive and the most social democratic, to stretch the term a bit because they're not social democratic in the conventional sense of the term. But nonetheless, they've managed these tensions uh, associated with globalization and building a democracy in the context of uh, a, peripheral, a peripheral economy quite successfully. So th this does suggest that democracy can be uh, a set of institutions and mechanisms that allow for uh, negotiating or managing a positive sum relationship to the global economy. So moving on. Um, so there's been this huge literature on democratic transitions. I think we're all pretty tired of it at this point. It was, an, it was a good literature. It was an important literature. We learned a lot from it. Uh, but it, of course, now begs the question, you know, what happens after the election? What happens once formal democratic institutions are in place? And a lot of people have, have, have now taken on this much broader theme of democratic deepening, including Archon. Um, and you know we could we could spend the whole seminar we could spend the whole semester on this topic alone. I just want to very briefly break it down uh, and bracket a few things and then uh, move on to what I want to focus on today. So one di one dimension beyond formal democracy, of course, is participatory democracy. The actual quality of day to day citizen engagements with uh, the polity with public affairs. I'll say more about that in a moment. And then there's the traditional preoccupation of the comparative political economy literature, which is with this, this question of substantive democracy. To what extent can a democracy deliver on the goods that will produce material outcomes that are more or less in keeping with uh, the democratic inputs of the democratic process itself? 
and here the sort of standard argument is the success cases of your Northern European social democracies, and they've been successful because of essentially a key agent, the working class, and so there's this whole working class power hypothesis. And the argument, it's a kind of Manker Olsonian argument, namely insofar as working class organizations are successful, they mobilize broadly, they build large union confederations, they then link up to broad programmatic political parties, you get a sort of logic of encompassing interests, right? This is the main goal. Um, and that's great. I, I think, personally, it's a pretty robust hypothesis. A number of people have shown both qualitatively and quantitatively that there's a strong association between the degree and coherence of working class organization and the degree to which democracies have substantively delivered as measured in terms of welfare, et cetera. Um, it's a, it's a terrific argument, but it doesn't travel very well to the global south. Uh, it doesn't travel very well because if you're going to wait for the working class to be the sort of agent of encompassing politics in the global south, uh, you, 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 you might as well be waiting for the dough. Um, even, even in China now, the, the, la the latest figures I've seen is that 25% of uh, workers in China are in manufacturing sector. And we've clearly moved beyond industrial produ production and the kind of histories of working class mobilization that are associated with the West uh, look uh, are less likely to uh, manifest themselves in, in the global south. In our four stories, uh, uh, again, Mauritius, Costa Rica, Chile, and Kerala, it turns out that the key protagonist is not the working class, but the smallholding peasantry, um, and that they, they were the social base of these agrarian forms of social democracy. And the smallholding peasantry itself is also a class that's less, increasingly less likely to be a major political actor. So we shouldn't be looking as maybe as much for uh, working class formation and maybe more for citizen formation. Um, and there's actually a second lesson here, namely that even the arguments about working class formation are first and foremost arguments about participation. I mean, if you only focus on the end result, the social democracy or the substantive outcomes, it's an argument about substantive democracy, but the road to the welfare state to encompassing politics was a road that was essentially paved by participatory forms of politics at the turn of the center. Um, so for me, before one even addresses the question of substantive democracy, we need to be unpacking this conception of participatory democracy. So let me turn to participatory democracy and just make a, a few points. These have been made you know, many times in the literature, uh, but I just want to put them on the table as part of the building blocks of for the analysis of the three cases. So why, why does participation matter so much? Um, you know, and, and one argument is that it's, a, it's important, obviously, to have formal democracy. That is the precursor to any other forms of democratization. And it's the, the necessary set of legal institutional prerequisites. But democracies don't make citizens, uh, per se. They grant citizens certain constitutional rights. But a bundle of rights does not a citizen make. Uh, a citizen is someone who can actually invoke, use, act upon those rights. So there's a, a huge gap between this thing we call citizenship, these constitutional guarantees of rights, and then the actual practices of citizens. So to some extent, I think if we're going to be serious about rights, we have to think about the kinds of politics that actually allow citizens to invoke and use their rights to make them, as it were, actionable. So we need to think about how citizens are made. A second point as to why we need to think about participation, and this is essentially the Amartya Sen argument in development is freedom, namely that development is ultimately, more than anything else, about a set of choices. I mean, there's always trade-offs in any set of, of, of policies in development, trade-offs between growth and sustainability, distribution and investment, et cetera. And that uh, ideally, uh, Sen argues in development as freedom, uh, you, you, you want to nurture the kind of participatory democratic politics that allow citizens to collectively make choices. Right? So in the book and elsewhere, he famously argues against the, the, the claim in some of the economics literature of the impossibility of social choice, and says instead that you, you need to create spaces, right? you need to make publics, um, and then borrows from some of the participatory to advance that argument in, in subsequent publications. Uh, and I want to highlight this point of publics because uh, later I'm going to talk about local government 
and I want to make the argument that the most important public in terms of thinking about participation is the local public. And then a third uh, claim about the importance of, sub, uh, of participatory democracy is that it functions as a countervailing power. And Archon's made this argument, the social movement uh, literature makes this argument. And the, the argument here is essentially um, a recognition that political society itself, if left to itself, has tendencies towards ossification, oligarchicalization, uh, infamous iron law and oligarchy, that, that insofar as political society is um, the pursuit of power, and power uh, begets more power, and, and that there are returns to scale, as with any other uh, scarce resource, uh, it's important to have build in participatory mechanisms in order to serve as a check, as a balance against these ossifying tendencies of political society. So those, those are the very broad claims. I'm going to skip that slide. Um, I want to make sure I have enough time to cover my cases. Uh, so um, so let, me, let me talk about BISA, which is um, a lousy acronym for Brazil, India, and South Africa. Um, <laughs> Well, it's now the fashion. There's all these bricks. What is it, brick and brick So this is my ISA. Um, and, and these two actually have something very real in common. They are uh, the three largest democracies in the global south, if you don't count Indonesia. And I, later on, maybe I can explain why they don't count Indonesia. But in any event, they all get exactly the same score in the Freedom House Index. Uh, not that I put too much stock in that. In, in, quantified measurements of democracy, but they're the three large global south democracies that make it to the number two rank, just below the first world democracies. Um, they're interesting test cases because we don't have to worry about democratic institutions per se in uh, any of these three democracies. Democracy is the only game in town. All the major social and political actors in India, Brazil, and South Africa recognize that democracy is the only game in town. The one exception are the Naxalites, Sort of Maoist insurrections in central India. They've actually been around for a while. You know, it's, it's a serious problem. It's a real internal security problem. Um, it, it's not threatening India's democratic institutions as of yet. Uh, in, all, in all three societies, there have been multiple elections. There's competitive uh, party systems. Basic rights are protected. Independent media, judiciary, all the sort of standard architecture of the modern democracy is in place. And all three have, and I hate this word, vibrant civil societies, but they really do have vibrant, uh, contentious, noisy civil societies um, that, among other things, are well protected by the basic uh, constitutional uh, architecture and infrastructure of these three democracies. These are rob robust democracies, and the probability of reversal is, is, is quite low. In all three cases, democracy really matters and has really made a difference. Um, I, I, I think it's, it's a clear-cut case that the only thing that's kept India together, given its extraordinary heterogeneity, inequality, poverty, et cetera, have been democratic practices and institutions. Um, the transition in South Africa has been an absolute model of a transition to a democratic order. And likewise, in Brazil, uh, and I'll say more about this uh, in a moment, but democracy has actually begun to deliver very concrete results. So democracy matters in all three very tangible ways. But what makes these three cases, I think, especially as a sociologist, incredibly interesting is that the whole project of building and deepening democracy is taking place against a backdrop of extraordinary inequality. And it doesn't matter how you measure it. If you take the Gini coefficient, which is the standard uh, income measure of inequality, South Africa and Brazil are always the most unequal in the world. India is not, but I, I actually think, and many economists think this, that's a measurement problem, uh, that if the data were better, it would be pretty unequal. If you take a more sociological definition of inequality as the production and reproduction of categorical inequalities, uh, caste systems, uh, racial exclusions, gender, other forms of, of marginalization of, uh, of specific social groups, um, it's hard to find societies that are more intrinsically unequal than post-apartheid South Africa, Brazil with its long history of uh, extreme uh, racial divisions, and India with the caste system and, and many other categorical inequalities. 
So uh, these, these three democracies, in, in very dramatic fashion, pose what's essentially, I think, always been one of the central problematics of political sociology, which is how do you resolve or narrow the gap between legal equality, the legal equality that comes with formal democracy, constitutions, basic rights of citizenship, and then the fact of extreme factual inequality on the ground. And this is an obvious tension. And in terms of almost every classic theory of democratization, uh, inequality is, 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 is uh, an, uh, generally thought of as an, a, 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 a terrible background condition for democratization. So democracy is usually associated with growth of the middle class, etc. And in all three of these societies, sure, there are middle classes, but more than anything else, they're still extremely involved. So relatively similar, um, quite similar points of departure. And yet I'm going to argue that in their uh, democratic periods, uh, once formal institutions are in place, these three democracies have actually tra traveled very different trajectories and today look very different, despite having the same ranking in the Freedom House in and I'm going to argue that India right now is actually going through a process of what I call involution. That increasingly, politics is organized around relatively narrow interests, various kinds of, quote, identity-based interests. Although, I hate to use the word identity because the coalitions themselves are so constructed, mostly constructed by politicians, that there's no primary identity at stake, per se. But increasingly, Indian politics are, are fragmenting. And the demand-making process is exactly the inverse of the kind of, uh, of encompassing dynamic that Olson and others identify with substantive democracy. It's really just become a very competitive form of rent seeking. And I'll say more about that later. But there's a clear process of evolution. In South Africa, I'm going to argue that the problem is a containerization. That is, you have a, a very well-organized, very vocal, very uh, capable civil society, but it's been totally locked out by the African National Congress's absolute control, quasi-hegemonic control of the political process, and that this is producing enormous tensions and feeding uh, conflict uh, and increasing social polarization. And then finally, I want to argue, um, and this is the, the happy story, as it were, but that in Brazil, it, it's possible to identify, and I should put projection with a question mark, because more than anything else, this is an argument I'm still trying to develop. But, in Brazil, um, it's possible to identify an, many ways in which civil society organizations, social movements, have in effect projected themselves into the political arena and profoundly transformed the way in which politics are transacted uh, in Brazil. So I want to try to make, I, this a, it's a very broad and abstract argument, so I, I sort of want to bring it literally um, to the ground by talking about local government transformation. Um, and there are a number of reasons why I think a focus on, on local government is, is useful in trying to flesh out this argument. One is it's, it's just a great strategic research site. And there's three reasons. You know, I mean, first of all, you know, when we, uh, generally when we think of development, we think of macroeconomic policies, we think of trade, we think of inflation, fiscal policy, taxation, et cetera. But the real work of, of development, at least early stages of development, is really the work of building up local services, building up local government. And it's at the local level that um, nominal citizens engage with the state and get access to security, get access to land, irrigation, public services, schooling, etc. It's also at the local level, and this is an old argument going back to John Stuart Mills and others, it's at the local level that citizens practice democracy, they become good at it, it's at the local level first form uh, public spaces and engage with the political process. And then there's a purely opportunistic reason for focusing on local government transformation, namely that all three of these countries, at the very moment that they were adopting more market-friendly policies and beginning to integrate more aggressively into the global economy, so roughly the late 80s, early 90s, at the very same time they were going in that direction of being uh, more market-friendly, they also instituted quite dramatic constitutional reforms designed to devolve power downwards. And a, a lot of observers say, well, this was just part of the, quote, neoliberal agenda. I think that's complete nonsense. Um, the, the, the timing is coincidental for a number of reasons, but the important thing is that in all three countries, 
At the moment of transition out of apartheid, uh, the ANC decentralizes quite dramatically. Uh, in India in 1993, the uh, Lok Sabha passes the 73rd and 74th constitutional amendments, which is the first time that local government in India is actually given real, genuine, democratic, and developmental powers. And in Brazil, the 88th constitution uh, very dramatically devolves uh, power, resources, and authority down the local level. So across these three very uh, different economies, you have a simultaneous process of decentralization. And so over the last uh, six, seven years, and this is in part why uh, Arkan and I keep meeting in these places, I've been running uh, separate projects looking at the impact of these decentralization reforms in all three countries. And I won't, I won't because I'm short on time, I'm just going to move on. But uh, essentially, these are all projects that, that look at a, a number of cases of decentralization in each country and then <coughs> try to assess the impact it's had both on local democracy as well as developmental outcomes. So let me very briefly take you through uh, the Indian case of local democracy. And uh, to sum up the, the story before 1993, um, I'm, I'm simply reminded of what Gertrude Stein said when she was asked what she thought of Oakland, which is where I lived as a graduate student, a place I really liked. Um, so I was disappointed when I heard she famously said, there's no there there. Um, and one could say essentially the same thing of local government um, before 1993, the average per capita expenditure in India at the local government level was less than 40 rupees a person, which is less than a dollar, roughly. Um, local governments were not elected, with the exception of West Bengal, uh, had very little power, and for all intents and purposes were simply conduits or gateways for uh, what in India are called uh, line departments, these top-down administrative departments, delivering services from the state capital. And you have to remember that the average Indian state capital represents a population of 40 to 50 million, depending on which entities you count as states, right? So it's bigger than the average Indian country. So the first point of citizen interface with democratically accountable officials in India takes place not at the village level, not at the municipal level, not at the district level, but at the level of the provincial state, right? And so uh, the, the chain of sovereignty is, is very stretched in that context. And there's very limited space for actual day-to-day -day forms of engagement with the state. Um, now, interestingly, Raj, you know, Rajiv Gandhi famously said, this was uh, back, I think, in the, in the late 80s, that 90 paisa of every rupee, so 90 cents of every rupee, is, is lost on its way down the chain. I mean, that the, the level of leakage is 90%. Is Imagine that. Right? So for every rupee spent on education or local area, 90% is frittered away. And it's actually Rajiv Gandhi who pushed the Panchayati Raj uh, reforms. And so this was very much something that was done in Delhi. It was the Congress party that decided they, they, they needed to build up local government. And they pushed through these reforms, which were, were quite revolutionary in their intent, but have had limited impact. And they've had limited impact outside of uh, some outlier cases, Kerala being one of them. <coughs> Largely because um, the initiative was left to the local states themselves, and the local states um, are, of course, you know, complex configurations of uh, in, uh, powerfully vested politicians and bureaucratic officials who don't want to devolve power. And so there's been little actual devolution of power in India, and instead it's pretty much business as usual, namely most services, most goods are still delivered through uh, political parties or brokers, um, and so, for the most part, uh, the, the, the local system of delivery is what I call a system of fragmented brokerage. That you have all these different intermediaries brokering between uh, highly fragmented constituencies and these uh, line departments. And so the result is really more a very sort of competitive process of narrow rent seeking rather than uh, the provision of public goods. What's the South African story? Well, in principle, the South African story should look a lot better because there's a much longer tradition to local government in South Africa. Apartheid, contrary to most people's sense of how it functioned, was a highly decentralized system. And if you think about it, to manage a system of absolute total segregation of races and employment, uh, access to services, residential areas, you actually need a lot of local government capacity. So 
South African cities in particular are highly capacitated, they have a lot of resources, they have a lot of revenue streams, uh, a lot of bureaucratic and technical capacity. And moreover, the anti-apartheid movement was driven primarily by township civics. So uh, the unions were powerful, the churches were powerful, uh, but the, the mass mobilization, especially towards the end of the anti-apartheid struggle, came from these township civics, which are community associations. And these were community associations that had really gotten into the business of governing the townships uh, in, uh, in the absence of the apartheid state delivering services. So, of course, when the transition takes place in 94, there's a, an enormous demand on the part of civil society organizations to institutionalize and give constitutional protection uh, to uh, this idea of local participatory government. So in all the foundational documents in the Constitution, in the RDP, which is the Reconstruction and Development Program, the emphasis is on delivery through local democratic structures. Right? And so they institute community development forms, they institute uh, something called the IDP, Integrated Development Planning, which is actually patterned after participatory budgeting in Brazil. So on paper, this looks like uh, a really sort of carefully thought through institutional set of mechanisms designed to promote active uh, participatory local democracy. In practice, within two years, the whole thing's been completely dismantled. Uh, you know, the ANC was a party in exile. People forget to see it. it ANC, ANC leadership was either in, in prison, like Mandela and all the other uh, folks on the island, um, or they were in military camps in Angola and Mozambique, or they were lobbying the West in, in, in London. Um, the day-to-day -day activity of, of mobilizing civics, unions, the churches, etc., was something the UDF did, the United Democratic Front. But when uh, the ANC came out of exile and was unbanned, it came back and took over the movement, and it disbanded the UDF. Um, and the entire leadership structure of the South African government, with, the, uh, with a few exceptions, was populated by uh, essentially uh, uh, ANC uh, uh, activists, um, and uh, it's a long story, but they had very Leninist, very vanguardist um, visions of asserting control over civil society. Uh, Jim Scott uses the term high modernism to describe this sort of idea that you can transform society from above. And as part of their own revolutionary rhetoric, they actually believe they had the technocratic skills and the resources to do development and to unmake apartheid from above. And they thought all these forms and participatory structures were just really too noisy and inefficient, et cetera. And so the ANC just disbanded everything, starting in 1996, with a few exceptions in the Western Cape, et cetera. But they disbanded the forums, and they brought in the consultants. And, and, and I'm, I'm quite serious. I, I know because I, I, you know, I'm ashamed to admit, but many times I was brought in as a consultant. You know, I was born in Switzerland, I studied India, and I was brought in, brought in many times as a consultant in South Africa, despite the fact that until I could get some research, I didn't really know much about the place. Um, but all the IDPs, all the strategies, all the delivery systems, everything ended up being designed by consultants. So a very technocratic approach. And the, the sum effect of this, of course, was the demobilization and disenfranchisement of civil society. And it, it's been really problematic. I mean, this is Mbeki lost his position as president of the ANC precisely because of this. There was a, eventually a sort of revolt from the branches in the ANC. People were incredibly disillusioned with the, the very top-down system of delivery that the ANC had, had developed. Um, and so Jacob Zuma, who's much more of a grassroots populist, is now president. But he's still dealing in, so in 2005, there were five, this is, these are official government figures, 5,000 what they call service delivery protests in South Africa, covering 90% of all municipalities. And these numbers are actually up since Zuma has become president. So there's a, a tremendous amount of mobilization and contention and conflict and quite a bit of violence. And a lot of this is simply a response to the fact that local communities feel completely locked out of the whole development apparatus as well. All right, so Brazil, turning to Brazil, Brazil and its local arenas. I should stop here. Um, so, you know, Brazil does not look like a very good candidate for democratic decentralization. Uh, the, the Brazilian Portuguese empire was a very weak empire. 
central authority was very weak. Authority was actually vested, um, feudal-like, in sort of local oligarchical control that began with land, but was extended to control over slave labor, and then later to various forms of free, but more or less uh, controlled labor. And so local political arenas in Brazil are, are notorious for uh, their very pervasive forms of clientelism. The, the leaders, we did this, this massive survey of municipalities in Brazil, and you know, most, a lot of, the number of mayors who are the sons of the former mayor, who's the son of the former, it's just extraordinary, right? I mean, it's just patri, patrimonial control over local government. Um, so you, you really wouldn't think of, of local government as a, as a space that's likely to be a source of democratization. And yet, in the context of the 1980s democracy movement, you have these very powerful urban social movements. Um, the, the loci of, of these movements is, is really the periphery of the larger cities. These are illegal populations, right? These are displaced peasants that have been moving in, 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 in large numbers in the cities occupying land illegally, you know, tapping into services illegally, but at the same time mobilizing to demand, and this was their slogan, rights to the city. They sort of picked up on this vocabulary. Um, and they mobilized ar around this principle of rights to the city. And um, they, at, at the moment of the Constitutional Convention, which is in 1988, these movements are extremely well organized and they're able to, in very profound ways, actually shape the Constitution. So much as in the case of South Africa, uh, the Brazilian Constitution has all these built-in mechanisms of participatory democracy. And I'll just mention two. One is what they call council democracy. So in almost every sector, environment, health, uh, education, the Constitution mandates that municipalities, all 5,000 municipalities in Brazil, have to constitute these neo-corporatist councils which are essentially, there's representation from civil society, from professional groups, and from the local, um, local government. And these councils are quite powerful because they have veto powers over, the, over federal allocations of money to the municipality. Right? So they, they have you know, real resources in hand. Um, and Brazil, of course, becomes this place where these movements experiment with something that comes to be known as participatory budgeting. Uh, Porto Alegre is a famous story, uh, but there's now 400 municipalities in Brazil that have adopted some version of participatory budgeting. So these are, are quite substantial institutional innovations. And in terms of, of, of democratic deepening, I think that the, the two points that really need to be emphasized here is that local, local, the local state is a contested arena that the, the traditional quasi-monopolistic control of oligarchical elites over local government has, has, has been broken, not in every municipality, of course, but in many. And um, this, this sort of you know, business, clientelistic politics as the business as usual now is no longer the business as usual. And you've had a very, and this is a, a very uh, powerful uh, finding from a study I did with Jean-Paul Baiocchi. We looked at 10 municipalities and we didn't look at Porto Alegre. And we did look at four municipalities in the, in the Northeast. And every one of them that adopted some form of participatory budgeting subsequently saw a very dramatic increase in civil society participation. Right? So all these groups are now much more actively involved and engaged in, 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 in political life, in part because they have somewhere to go, right? which is the participatory budgeting process. Um, so very different set of outcomes than from India and Brazil. So in the time that I have left, which is what, about 10 minutes? Five to, five to 10. OK, I'll, I'll try to be brief. Um, I want to do the history of these three democracies in the time that I have left. But what, 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 what I want to just suggest um, or give you a sense of is, is the larger backdrop against which I want to make this argument that India, Indian civil society is becoming increasingly involuted. For, for the first 20 or so years uh, post independence, the Congress system, which is essentially the Congress party is in power, it's an umbrella organization, it's pretty good at mobilizing a wide uh, sector of interests, caste groups, etc. But it's organizationally a very weak power, uh, political party. So one of the things that the Congress does is it doesn't rule through its own organizational structures, it rules through local power brokers. So it's, it's usually the local elites, landed elites or caste elites in the rural areas. <coughs> 
And of course that ends up reinforcing local power structures. These nonetheless begin to fall apart uh, by the 70s and 80s. There's this phenomenon that Yogendra Yadev calls the se second democratic upsurge, which is a period in the 80s where lower castes start voting for lower caste politicians, right? because the Congress was usually an upper caste party. And so you get the, this a mobilization of, of lower caste groups on their own terms, but the, the problem is that it's, it's, it's this kind of competitive mobilization of, around very segmented identities, and often quite artificially constructed identities. So the most important acronym in Indian, polit Indian politics today is the OBC category. So for those of you who know India recognize this, but it's the other backward caste category. And it, from state to state, it's a completely different set of coalitions. But in the name of OBCs, all these demands have been made for affirmative action, for what they call the reservation system in India. Um, and, and identities, in other words, have been highly politicized. And demands are being made in the name of groups and in the name of group, group grievances and not in the name of citizenship rights or in the name of provisioning of public goods. So you have this, what I call, instrumentalization of politics and a civil society that's folding back on itself. And I can give you a lot more examples, but since I need to move on, um, I'll maybe take this up uh, later. South Africa is in a somewhat better position, and you know I have to word this very carefully. Uh, one one of the things that apartheid did was it compressed identities. I mean, what, what apartheid did was created a black urban proletariat. Right. So whether you were Indian or quote colored or African, whether you were Kosa or Zulu, in the big townships of Soweto and Alex and, and Deep Sluts. Ultimately, everyone was a subject, a person deprived of, of, of fundamental rights of citizenship. And the movement itself, of course, uh, mobilized around a very inclusive, pan-racial, citizenship-based conception of democratic equality. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the good news here is that identity politics so far in South Africa have not been the problem per se. Uh, that the degree of associational equality is actually quite, quite advanced. Um, that the sense of, of rights and the sense of uh, using your rights is, is quite developed, that civil society is still very organized, be it the unions or the NGO sector or uh, other components of uh, township civil society. The problem, though, is, is, is the ANC. It's a, it's a dominant uh, political party. It gets re-elected in every cycle by 66 some percent. Um, it's in a position where it really doesn't have to answer to civil society. And it's, it's, I've, I've done hundreds of interviews, and it's absolutely fascinating, because you talk to these, these civil society activists, and they're furious at the ANC. They say things like, these guys went from the struggle to the gravy train. Uh, they're in it for themselves. They have this, this, this you know, almost Habermasian critique of, of instrumentalized politics. And then you ask them, who are you going to vote for? And of course, that's where identity politics kicks in. You can't vote for the DA, that's a white party, it's associated with apartheid, et cetera. So the ANC keeps getting reelected, and there's really no mechanism of accountability. And civil society, for all intents and purposes, has been contained. It's a bit more complicated because I, I argue, in fact, it's been bifurcated. That is, well organized, highly professionalized form of civil society, the kinds of civil society organizations that can do consulting services have a very good relationship with the state, and I call it contractual patronage. But all your grassroots uh, organizations, uh, the unions that are not in the formal sector, the civics, um, the, the organizations that come out of informal settlements, etc., they've been completely locked out. And so that increasingly they've resorted to protest and in some cases violence. There's one famous uh, case that actually helps, I think, make the point, which is the treatment action campaign which maybe I'll talk about later. So finally, Brazil. Um, here the argument is that civil society has, in effect, projected itself into the state and into public policy. The most obvious um, illustration of this is the PT itself. The, the PT is a social movement party. The PT is a party that came out of social movements. Now that it's been in power for eight years, it's increasingly behaving like a political party, and there have been all these corruption scandals, etc. But uh, as, a, as a party formation itself, it was really more, not, little more than an umbrella organization that was created to represent uh, 
uh, different social movements, and so it has been a conduit for movements into the state apparatus itself. That the nature of politics in Brazil has, uh, I think, uh, uh, created a real rupture with the past, uh, because the, the, the normative claims and the actual political practices of civil society in Brazil are essentially about um, undoing the legacies of clientelism. And it's quite extraordinary when you're, and you're in Brazil and you talk to activists and you talk to the NGO sector, and they will always tell you that more than anything else, they're mobilizing to undo the, the, the heritage, the legacy of clientelistic politics. And movements have literally created a very distinctive ethical political field. The, the best example of this is what happened with HIV AIDS when it became clear that Brazil was threatened with a pandemic at exactly the same time South Africa uh, was threatened with a pandemic. In South Africa, the response by the ANC was, we can't afford to do this. You know, Mbeki did his online research and decided HIV doesn't cause AIDS. And because the party doesn't answer to civil society, this was the policy for six years, and now there's five million infected people. Uh, in Brazil, from the beginning of the crisis, the civil society sector defined the epidemic as a human rights issue, right? And that access to ARVs was a, a basic human right. It wasn't about cost. It wasn't about, as in the case of India, dealing with dangerous populations. It was simply a human right, and there was very aggressive state intervention. And uh, South Africa and Brazil had the same infection rates in the mid-'80s, and today, I think in Brazil, it's below 200,000 with full universal free access to ARVs, whereas in, in South Africa, it's now 5 million infected persons. Um, these movements, moreover, have been able to mobilize and partner with the state without being captured by the state. And the HIV sector is, is a, a very good uh, example of that, but it's true in the anti-dam sector, the land reform sector, with the famous MSD, et cetera. And that these civil society politics and this projection of the state have actually been institutionally consequential. They've um, exp literally expanded the surface area of the state. Um, kit, uh, Margaret Keck and I forget her co-author. No, 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 no. The, the other book with Hochstetler on the I think Hochstetler. That's it. They have, they have a new book on uh, the Green Movement in Brazil, and they interview all these activists. And the biggest complaint on the part of the activists is they have to go to too many meetings with the government. They're really they're literally overextended because this council democracy is so widespread, and the points of engagement are so intensive that they don't have the capacity. But of course they're. I'm happy to have access to the state. And just one other really quick example. In 2001, the urban social movements in Brazil passed, uh, pushed through national legislation. It's called the city statute. And it's legislation, and, and it's quite extraordinary if you think about this, it's legislation that defines all property within the municipalities as having a social function, which means that the local state can actually tax private property, um, a, a social tax, if that private property is not being used in a way that's determined to be socially useful to the overall needs of the city, which gives them an, an extraordinarily important uh, tool for uh, planning. So, um, uh, bullet, bullet point, a uh, bullet point conclusion, despite these very similar uh, conditions, initial conditions, and, and, and basic institutions of consolidated uh, democracy, these three democracies have actually traveled very different uh, routes uh, since becoming democratic. Uh, the differences are, you know, and this is always true, but they're historical and they have to do with, I think, the, the timing of democratization, but also the particular configuration of movements and parties uh, uh, at, at, at the moment of democratic consolidation. Um, a, a general finding here, um, that needs a lot more elaboration, but I, I do want to argue that in, in the absence of these effective points of interface between civil and political society, what tends to happen is that political society becomes increasingly dominant, largely at the expense of civil society, and usually with the result that civil society either demobilizes, as in the case of South Africa, or becomes increasingly fragmented, as in the case of India. Um, and one point that I want to make here is that the degree and quality of participation or mobilization or the vibrancy of civil society doesn't just mirror the, the nature of social structure. I mean, you could make the argument in, you know, civil society is weak in India because uh, India has a caste system and it's incredibly unequal. I actually don't, 
within India, that argument doesn't work because there's exceptions like Kerala and there's a number of sectors where, despite extraordinary inequality, uh, movements and, and various civil society organizations have been formed and have been quite uh, proactive. But the simple point is that the inequalities in South Africa, India, and Brazil don't simply map onto the participatory practices. There's something else going on there. And then, as always, you know, a call for more.